One of the purposes of the Hood Fund is to facilitate the visit of distinguished international scholars to the university, to give public lectures and departmental seminars, and to engage with staff and students on matters of mutual interest and enlightenment. When the fellowship was established, it was very much with scholars like uh, Melissa Lane in mind. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to welcome her formally to the university. She and her husband, Andrew, have spent a couple of weeks traveling in the South Island, so they've gone some way towards becoming natives already, so <laughs> welcome. Melissa graduated from Harvard University and then took an MPhil and a PhD from the University of Cambridge. She was appointed to a university lectureship in history and elected to a fellowship of King's College in 1994. She was appointed professor of politics at Princeton in 2009 and then in 2014 was appointed class of 1943 professor of politics at that university. She's been a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. People often fall in love when they're undergraduates, and in Melissa's case, the object of her early passion was Plato. <laughs> this was, on her own account, I must say, uh, this was a matter of love at first sight, since it occurred in the initial class she attended in a course on Plato's Republic. The passion has proved to be lasting, and it's formed the starting point of an ac academic career marked by close engagement with a range of classical political thought and by an admirable ability to explore its ongoing impact on the history of Western political thought. Um, particular areas of focus have been the fate of Platonism after Plato, the basis of political constitutions, ideas of citizenship, and of particular importance in relation to tonight's lecture, modern attempts to grapple with large-scale environmental issues such as climate change. Melissa is the author of four well-received books arising from her research and of more than 50 articles and chapters on ancient political thought and its use, ethics and public policy, and modern political thought and political philosophy. She is at present one of the academic leaders of a Climate Futures Initiative project funded out of Princeton and has an ongoing role in policy advising and public communication on environmental ethics. She re recently had an opinion piece in the New York Times um, on the importance of classical political texts for contemporary politics. In tonight's lecture, Melissa will draw upon her expertise in Aristotle's rhetoric to explore the cognitive and ethical dimensions of effective communication on climate change and illuminate the relationship between expertise and democracy. No doubt one of the issues which sparked her early infatuation with Plato. So welcome, Melissa. We're very much looking forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm indebted to Professor Morrow for that very kind introduction, the more so as it comes not just from a deputy vice chancellor, but from someone who's himself a leader in the field of political thought. And it's truly an honor to be visiting this university as a Hood Fellow. And let me try to say, kia ora kato katoa. Um, I've been trying to learn something while I've been here. Um, and I'd like to express my deep thanks to the University of Auckland Foundation and all the donors who contributed to establish these fellowships um, in honor of Sir John Hood, to the Faculty of Arts, the School of Social Sciences, Politics and International Relations, and all those who've helped to arrange this opportunity to exchange ideas. What it means to exchange ideas is actually my topic today. What it means for scientific claims to be understood and engaged with by citizens in a democratic society. And I'll be turning to Aristotle to help us do so. Why turn back to an ancient Greek? Well, in part because the Greeks kept together what modern universities have pulled apart into separate and too often isolated disciplines. In Plato and Aristotle, we can still see the deep interconnections between politics, ethics, epistemology, 
and rhetoric. So in turning to these past figures and trying to bring them into conversation with our present needs, I actually draw inspiration from a great Kiwi figure, John Pocock, who was in fact the very first incoming Hood Fellow 10 years ago. Now that may seem odd because as some of you will know, Pocock is well known for a reverent concern to interpret ideas within their historical context. But he once observed that the history of political thought must consist in significant measure of actors doing things that historians of political thought insist that they should not do. And that is appealing to past ideas for present purposes. And I see no reason insofar as we now are actors in our own time to deprive ourselves of those very resources and practices that so informed the figures we study in the past. So the ethics of communicating climate change and how Aristotle can help us think about it. So let me share the steps that brought me to this topic. And in doing so, I'll give you an outline um, for the talk. I see the question of how to communicate the science of climate change and science more generally to non-scientists as one of the great challenges of our time. It's not the only challenge that climate change raises by any means, but I think it is an important one of them. And I know it's one that some of you here today may have experienced firsthand. I was interested to read about the submission that was made by a number of staff from the Faculty of Science recently to the government's formal consultation on setting a new emissions target um, for New Zealand. And it was precisely in talking with an IPCC scientist um, about communication challenges that he had witnessed in the fourth assessment report, so that was the one that came out in 2007, not the most recent one that I was brought to consider the gaps in the current philosophical literature on the ethics of communication. And so that's going to be the first quarter of the talk, will be this example from the IPCC and what contemporary philosophy um, can tell us about it and where that falls short. And then that led me, those gaps led me to turn to contemporary psychology on communicating climate change, which has actually become something of a cottage industry. There's a major boom in the communication of climate change in social psychology. And so that will be the second quarter of the talk. Um, but I found gaps there too. And it was those mirror image gaps that led me, um, working with Michael Lamb, to suggest ways that Aristotle's rhetoric might help us advance. And so that'll be the second half of the talk. So the first quarter, um, the professional role of scientists in communicating climate change and the framework of communicative ethics in philosophy. So here's the story from the preparation for um, the IPCC um, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fourth assessment report, and this was working group one, the hard science, as it were. And they were working to, to um, present a table of possible future sea level rise due to climate change. But at that time, um, geoscientists had only recently recognized the contribution of one particular process. So broadly speaking, there were three major um, processes in relation to uh, sea ice that could contribute to sea level rise, and one of them, which was the sliding of ice sheets, had recently been recognized to be significant, but at the time there was no model to predict future increases in sliding, and so to allow numbers to be put on it. And so that created a quandary for the scientists who were trying to put this table together. And the question was, what should they do? They had numbers for two of the three sets of factors, and then they had this third factor that they knew was extremely important, they thought was probably, they didn't know, they thought was extremely important, but they couldn't quantify it. So what sort of table do you present to policymakers and to the public? So let me actually leave that question with you. Why don't you think for a few minutes as I speak about how you would do this, and at the end of the talk, I'm gonna come back to what they actually did and what I think Aristotle would have recommended that they do um, 
instead. But in the meantime, thinking about that case actually set me off again with co-authors um, to look for guidance, a sort of broad guidance, how should scientists think about communicating those sorts of uncertainties. We were actually specifically interested at that time in the communication of uncertainty in particular. And so we said, well, let's go and look in the philosophical literature on the ethics of communication and see what guidance we might find. There's actually not as much of that as you might expect. Um, Jonathan Barnes has observed dryly that modern philosophy does not greatly occupy itself with rhetoric. But the most helpful work that we found was by Honora O'Neill, sometimes with co-authors. And her basic insight is that um, communication is ethically acceptable only when it aims to be accessible to and accessible by its audiences. That's a bit of a tongue twister, so let me just unpack that. So accessible to, meaning that the perspective of the audience is key, and accessible by, meaning that the audience are judges, not passive recipients of the communication. And they're going to be judging it from the standpoint of their own practical and intellectual commitments. They're not receiving the communication in a void or as sort of a passive, inert container. They're judging and receiving in terms of their own concerns. So, so far, I think this philosophical work has shown that we have to think of communication, in particular scientific communication, as practical and relational. And so far, so good. But this philosophical work turned out also to be, I thought, wantingly one-dimensional. And it was one-dimensional in the sense that it was concerned with cognitive questions alone. So it was treating communication and trust as if they were simply um, involving cognitive responses, cognitive assessments. So O'Neill wrote in work with Neil Manson, for example, that um, trust in communication relies on combining informed with independent judgment. And those were the only factors that they mentioned, the cognitive factor aspect of judgment. But what we found when we then turned to this cottage industry of climate change communication in psychology is that actually there are crucially not just one dimension to communication, but two. And so this brings me to the second part of the talk where I want to talk about what the social psychologists add by bringing the second dimension for what I think is still problematic um, in their approach. So social psychologists identify two fundamental dimensions of social judgment, generally in any relationship, but including uh, communication and as we'll see specifically involving climate communication. And these they broadly label competence on the one hand and warmth on the other. Now that warmth may not sound like a very technical term, but it is the technical term in the literature. If you look for a definition, you get what sounds even less technical. So the warmth dimension is also the social good-bad dimension, as opposed to the intellectual good-bad dimension, which is um, the competence dimension. And the crucial insight is that these dimensions may actually um, conflict. So trust, the willingness to accept the communication as intended, is going to be a function of both. And it's going to mean that both dimensions have to be positively present for that trust to be likely. And this leads to a crucial, competent, uh, crucial problem that psychologists have labeled cold competence. So this arises when speakers are judged to be competent. Audiences believe that they know what they're talking about, but they don't trust them to share the goals and values of themselves as listeners. And so they may, in that case, be disposed to reject the communication altogether. The warmth dimension, when it's lacking, can undermine the effect of the competence 
um, dimension. Now that's obviously a very serious problem when it comes to communicating climate change because it means that even scientists who are granted to be immensely competent at their science may still not be trusted by the public if the very role of scientists as a group or at, as part of an institution is judged to give them what Bentham might have called sinister interests. Now, I think that can be a very hard thing for us to know how to take seriously, perhaps especially for those of us who are inclined as philosophers to want to take the, the cognitive dimension more seriously and to assume that that must be able to do all the work. Surely we might think, as academics especially, competence, expertise is what really matters in communication. Why should it matter whether people are per perceived as warm and fuzzy? But I think we really do need to take this seriously because it means that the philosophical insights that communication is practical and relational need to be joined by the psychological insight that it's also what I'm going to call whole personal. It's not just a matter of the mind, but of the whole person's orientation to the communication in which non-cognitive factors can be as important as the cognitive ones and can disable or undermine the cognitive claims. In a talk here on the value of the arts yesterday, Cynthia Enlow was suggesting that any good theory should be able to be put on a bumper sticker. So I was trying to think, what's my bumper sticker for this talk so far? And I came up with communication is practical, relational, and whole personal. Now that might not be a very good bumper sticker, um, but I'm going to console myself by thinking that climate change may make bumper stickers and cars obsolete um, anyway. Now, psychologists have actually done more detailed study of the conditions in which this kind of cold competence is perceived. And they've also offered their own suggestions of how climate change communication can be improved. So I want to just take a moment to review each of those um, before I finally turn to Aristotle. So bear with me for a few more minutes on the social psychology. So let's look in a bit more detail at the basic dynamics of competence and warmth. In many cases, the perception of expertise will be a default cue for listener trust. So I'm not saying competence doesn't have any role. The default may well be, in many cases, that if one perceives a, a speaker as competent, one will be inclined to trust what she's saying. But what the research shows is that once a challenge to the good intent of a speaker has been raised, and that might well happen with the manufacture of denial about climate change, for example, that's been so well chronicled by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway in their book Merchants of Doubt, for example, once that challenge has been raised, then potential suspicion needs to be directly addressed, lest it corrode into distrust. So at that point, the kind of interesting problem is if there's simply a, 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 a neutral signal of intent, not even a negative one, but just a neutral one, even that neutral signal may be interpreted negatively because there's no positive signal that's strong enough um, to support trust. Now the psychologists Susan Fisk and Sidney Dupre have applied this research directly to science communication and even directly to climate change communication. And what they've done is to look at the perceptions of warmth that are typically ascribed to different occupational groups. And this part of the research has been done cross-culturally. Um, and what they found is that this problem of cold competence cross-culturally tends to afflict groups that include scientists and researchers who are not as groups generally trusted to share the goals and values of listeners. And in fact, they found that climate scientists may be distrusted specifically on the grounds of intent, particularly on um, the finding is that people are very likely to think that they're interested in gaining research money 
for themselves, and that's a particular way in which their intent may be suspect. There is another um, list of possible dis grounds of distrust that aren't as widely shared that include alleged motives to lie with statistics, complicate a simple story, show superiority, gain research money, pursue a liberal agenda, provoke the public, and hurt big corporations. And what they suggest is that, again, once the public's been motivated to scrutinize their intent, scientists can't afford to neglect showing themselves to have trustworthy motives, because if they don't, these suspect motives are very likely to rush in and fill the gap. People are predisposed to otherwise ascribe them. So how can climate change communicators address this problem? This and Dupre themselves adopt a strategy that's quite characteristic of social psychologists generally. And what they do is they suggest that a simple act of reframing might do the trick. So in this case, there's some good news in their occupational group studies, which is that teachers and professors are generally rated as warm and well-intentioned. So that might be good news for many of us here. Um, and so they say, well, why not just reframe the cli climate scientists? Just call them teachers and professors instead of scientists and researchers, and then people will be disposed um, to trust them. And this kind of reframing is very often the kind of line that I found social psychologists to take. So another example um, is research by Dan Cahan and colleagues at Yale. Um, who come to very similar conclusions about the factors involved in whether speakers trust, auditors trust climate change communicators. And they've shown that um, important factors are whether a speaker is perceived as sharing the auditor's values and worldview, and whether the policies that are proposed accord with those values and worldview. And so they suggest some simple fixes. So they say, why not put nuclear power on the list of policy options? That might appeal to some people who would otherwise be turned off. And have religious leaders um, present messages about climate change, because that can harmonize with the worldview of their followers. Now, these ideas are not necessarily bad in themselves. And I think the power of um, Pope Francis's recent encyclical on climate change is testimony, for example. So I'm not saying these are at all bad strategies, per se. But what worries me in the orientation of this literature is this general perspective that this is just really a matter of finding the right technical fix, that we can just swap out these frames until we find the best one, that we can test the frames in a kind of one-off experimental setting without thinking about the effect of all these swapping might have in people's trust over time. And broadly, that this issue is just about technical efficacy, and that in all of this discussion of reframing, I, it's very hard to find explicit attention to the question of what kinds of reframing are ethical, and whether there are actually ethical limits to these strategies. And I think that there's a real kind of meta danger here, that even if these strategies may be piecemeal more effective, that the public may come to see all this reframing as manipulative, which might only harden resistance. For after all, it's exactly that kind of strategic reframing for successful persuasion that led many ancient Greek thinkers to be suspicious of rhetoric, to fear it as pure manipulation. In Plato's Gorgias, for example, Socrates attacks sophistic, sophistic rhetoric as a form of flattery, a deceptive attempt to say whatever pleases the people. Now, it's important to say that psychologists are, are very keen to recognize, in general terms, the importance of ethics um, to what they're doing. Um, but I think they've actually done rather less to knit ethics into the fabric of these studies. So for example, a report on behalf of the discipline in 2009 on psychology and global climate change said climate change is an interdisciplinary issue and psychologists should make connections to other researchers 
But the only fields they mentioned were social science, natural science, and engineering. They never mentioned ethics, philosophy, political theory as fields that psychologists need to um, broker interdisciplinary uh, research with. And similarly, one of the most comprehensive volumes on climate change communication, edited by Suzanne Moser and Lisa Dilling, also calls for increased multi and interdisciplinary research on communication and social change. But again, they focus almost exclusively on empirical research in the natural and social sciences. And in that volume, they say explicitly that the primary evaluative yardstick should be strategic effectiveness. So the sort of uh, concern with ethics at a very general level hasn't worked its way into the actual research program of the discipline. So here's where I've come to um, at the end of this first half of the talk. And I think there are blind spots that in a way mirror each other in these two disciplines. So on the one hand, empirical research in psychology neglects a full engagement with the ethical dimensions of climate change. It acknowledges the importance in general, but doesn't really look into it in practice. But on the other hand, the philosophers are concerned with the ethical dimension, but they minimize or neglect the affective, social, warmth dimensions of communication that the psychologists stress. So this leaves us bereft of ethical guidelines for approaching problems like cold competence that can take the affective dimension of communication seriously enough. What we need is to think about communication in a way that's both effective and ethical. And I think we can find an excellent example, a model of how to do that, of how to think of ethics and effectiveness as joined together at the root in Aristotle's rhetoric. So let me now turn to the resources of Aristotle's rhetoric um, as a way of addressing some of these problems, filling some of these gaps in the modern literatures. Aristotle recognized the dangers of pandering and manipulation that his teacher Plato had so feared, and that still often attach disparagingly to the term rhetoric itself. But he held that rhetoric was nevertheless indispensable. What we need is to reform it and use it well, not just throw it out. Because rhetoric is the art of seeing the norms and modes of persuasive communication as such. And that has to be the foundation stone of any society in which some have expertise that others lack and in which people have to reason together about how to act. So in the very beginning of the rhetoric in 1.1, book 1, chapter 1, Aristotle says that um, all people in some way share in both dialectic, the uh, means of logical argument, and rhetoric, the means of persuasive communication. And he also sees that its rhetoric is useful in matters where people have differential abilities. So he remarks that not everyone has the ability to see many things altogether or to reason from a distant starting point. And here I actually diverge from some scholars of the rhetoric who think that it's only about uh, only useful among people who are considered full equals um, in every respect. So Eugene Garber, for example, says the rhetoric is about those aspects of human affairs for which there are no experts. I actually don't think that's right. I think Aristotle is also thinking about cases where, in fact, there is expertise. There's a differential status and role of the speaker and the listener. So rhetoric provides a way to communicate audience, ideas to audiences with different levels of technical understanding. So now what I want to do is to suggest that Aristotle's account is congenial to the partial insights that we've gleaned from modern philosophy and psychology so far. But then I want to suggest some ways that I think he can help us to take them further. So I'll start by showing some of the commonalities with what I've been arguing already but then spend some time developing Aristotle's ideas um, in more depth. 
So like Honora O'Neill, um, Aristotle insisted that the audience of rhetoric should be regarded as its judge. Um, and he said judgment is that for the sake of which rhetoric is used. So this fits with, and I think actually um, uh, inaugurated the idea of communication as relational, and perhaps goes further in really stressing this agency of audiences, um, that audiences are going to be active judges, not simply passive receivers. But Aristotle, I think, does better than our modern separated disciplines in arguing for a deep conjoining of what's effective with what's ethical. So he really works out why the ethical and the effective might go together, which is something that we saw psychologists just tend to hopefully assert. And then he works out why what is ethical also has to be whole personal. Um, so he gives us, I think, an even richer account than modern psychology does of that insight. So let me explain each of those um, claims. So first, um, Aristotle suggests, again at the beginning of the rhetoric, that humans have a natural disposition for the true, and to a large extent, hit on the truth. And Jonathan Lear um, has put this very well. He says, um, for Aristotle, we have a natural sort of disposition, a natural disposition to understand. We are cognitively at home in the world. And that's why Aristotle is able to claim um, that rhetoric is likely in the long run, and other things being equal, to be most effective when it's rooted in truthful claims. Even though in the short run, he admits that, that people may exploit the art to purvey falsehoods. Now that may sound overly optimistic. You might think, well, if only right, that were true. But I actually think that um, it doesn't behoove us to dismiss that too quickly. Because it seems to me it's in line with the very nature of science and of universities to be committed to the view that humans are naturally disposed on some level to the truth. And it suggests a deeper reason for being concerned that rhetoric is ethical. That's not just about avoiding political backlash that rhetoric needs to be ethical because it's contributing to this basic human endeavor. But then the question is, well, so how do we develop this ethical rhetoric? And now I want to really dig into some of the details of Aristotle's approach. Danielle Allen has described Aristotelian rhetoric as an art of trust production. And I think that's a very good way of thinking about it. It's a kind of art of producing trust, exactly the goal that we're seeking. And it does so um, by identifying three distinct, what we might think of as communicative capacities, three means of persuasion or proof. And those are both translations of the Greek word pistis, um, which can encompass, um, as uh, scholars have explained, a whole set of qualities, including trust, trustworthiness, credence, and credibility. So pistis kind of runs the gamut from a hard notion of proof to a much softer notion of persuasion. And it's really fundamentally about credibility. And these three means of persuasion are logos, which is making arguments, ethos, in Greek, we, we would say ethos, but I'm going to say ethos. It's more familiar. Um, character, broadly speaking. And pathos, um, emotions. Now notice that we started with the philosophers who only had one dimension of communication, the cognitive. And then we turned to the two dimensions of the social psychologists, um, competence and warmth. And we saw a kind of mechanical way that one might undercut the other, right? We just have to kind of get them in line. But what Aristotle, I think, does is offer these three dimensions. And I'm going to try to develop some of the subtleties of this account, because what he shows is that these dimensions are not separate and kind of distinct. Actually, on Aristotle's account, each one of these, logos, ethos, and pathos, is interdependent with the others. 
So you can think of each one as being like a Russian doll that's containing the subset of the others within it. And I think that seeing the details of how this works actually can be very illuminating um, for our present concerns. So I want to illustrate this by just focusing on ethos, on character, and showing how this alone integrates cognitive, moral, and affective dimensions. So we might think, oh, character is just the moral part. But what Aristotle's analysis shows is that actually thinking about character itself involves argument, a form of character and emotion. They're all connected. So first of all, he says, well, we might have a case where uh, we, we recognize that a speaker has certain kinds of, let's say, theoretical competence, but they're still lacking in practical wisdom, of course, Aristotle's notion of phronesis. Um, in the sense of understanding how knowledge is relevant to deciding what ought to be done in contexts of uncertainty. And what's interesting in his account here is that Aristotle sees that as a kind of character flaw. That if someone has a certain kind of theoretical competence but can't see how that might be broadly relevant to practical concerns, that itself is going to be reason for a kind of distrust of their character as a speaker because one won't trust the inferences um, that they might make, the ability that they would have to make the kind of judgment calls uh, that the scientists in AR4, for example, were being called upon to do. Now, I want to stress that this point about phronesis doesn't mean that all scientific claims have to have a prescriptive policy dimension. Of course not. And in fact, there's a kind of complication here because other modern research um, in psychology has shown that the public trusts scientists when they're impartial, not when they're trying to push particular policy agendas. So the point is, I think, a more kind of higher level general one. It's rather that having some ability to see the practical implications of one's theoretical understanding is what matters, and being able to share what those practical implications are, not to prescribe um, what uh, some particular course of action. OK, so that's how character has this cognitive dimension that, that might seem unexpected. But then there might be a case where we say, OK, this speaker has scientific knowledge, theoretical competence. They have good judgment. We give them full marks on the whole cognitive range. But we might still, Aristotle says, distrust them if we think that they lack what the Greeks called virtue or excellence, arete. Now again, this may seem, you know, how does this possibly come into science communication? But you might think of cases where someone who is knowledgeable has lacked the courage to defend their convictions in the face of challenge or cases where they've lacked the humility to listen to people with different forms of expertise or experience. So those might be failures of virtue that, again, are going to undermine character, even when someone is recognized to have full cognitive um, understanding. And finally, and perhaps most relevant to the social psychology of climate change communication, um, listeners may credit speakers with the full cognitive package and with virtue, so they're doing really well so far, but they may still think that they lack the attitude of what Aristotle calls goodwill, eunoria, towards themselves, the listeners, or their group. Now, this is sort of a hard case to understand because ex hypothesi, we said, this is a case where the listeners judge the speakers to be virtuous. So why would they think that they lack goodwill? It seems like a funny case for Aristotle to identify. And I actually think this is one of the most interesting ways that Aristotle's account of rhetoric modifies his ethics. So someone may have the moral virtues and be disposed to act rightly in general, but it doesn't follow that they'll be well disposed to every particular audience to advise them well. Right? Aristotle still thinks that 
communication is so audience sensitive that audiences may still suspect and be uh, suspicious even in that kind of case. And that's actually, I think, really the case of cold competence, that it's one where scientists and researchers are judged to be competent, they might be judged to be virtuous in general, but they're not trusted to share warmth, good intent, concern broadly for the interests of their um, audience. So how does Aristotle say then that we can um, address such distrust? So he has a lot of different um, uh, ways of thinking about this. And I'm going to focus particularly on what he says about the emotions, which dominates um, book two of the rhetoric. This is where he spends most of his analysis. And he analyzes a long list of specific negative emotions, um, including anger, fear, shame, unkindliness, indignation, envy. But all of these reflect a sense of loss or pain where an auditor feels that a speaker's interests might be opposed um, to her own. And, he, and Aristotle then thinks about how do these negative emotions arise and what can be done to try to alleviate them. So this is the final sort of main set of points that I want to make. And I'm just going to look at the interplay of two of these, um, fear and anger, that I think are especially interesting, and then how Aristotle thinks we can address them. So fear um, generates suspicion towards speakers who, on the one hand, whose motives might seem harmful to us, but it can also attach, we'll see as can anger, simply to the bearers of bad news. Um, so Aristotle even says when he talks of anger that we feel anger towards speakers who um, speak badly of and scorn things that we take most seriously and who, quote, do not care if we are suffering. And he says, this is why we become angry at those announcing bad news. So I think there's a, a real um, lesson here that simply telling the bad news that may be the factual case um, about climate change itself is very likely to make people suspicious because if one's simply telling bad news without enough of a sense that one understands the practical implications of that for the lives and concerns of the listeners, that itself may well make these listeners resentful and suspicious. And again, researchers have shown that actually fear appeals in climate change communication are often ineffective at generating action. They may seem the most rational. It may seem, well, the most rational thing to do is to tell people, look, here's the bad news. Be afraid of these possible consequences. And yet, it's precisely that that may make people um, turn off. Similarly, Aristotle also says there's a kind of um, dilemma about fear. Because if you say that the events are too far off, people won't fear them, so they're not going to listen. But if you say they're too near at hand, then you fall into this trap of being the bearer of bad news again. OK, so how does Aristotle say then that um, communicators can try to address these negative emotions? I think what's most important is his emphasis that all of this has to be a matter of long-term uh, trust and the gaining and relationships, that these are not one-off um, fixes that are possible, um, but rather that recognizing this role of the emotional, um, this, in, this complex interplay between character, emotion, and reasoning, and addressing it explicitly is actually what can gain credibility over time. So he gives some more specific counsel as well. And again, some of it, I think, is going to sound very unfamiliar um, and perhaps unpropitious um, to our ears. So they include, for example, the value of humility. So Aristotle says that those who humble themselves can neutralize. So speakers who try to humble themselves can neutralize these negative emotions towards them of anger and fear. 
And he actually gives the example um, in 2.3 in the rhetoric saying, well, dogs won't bite someone who's sitting down. Um, a, an editor of the rhetoric says, you should only really try this if the dog's owner is near at hand. Um, so be warned. Um, but I actually think that this idea about humility, which again may seem a very odd thing to be counseling, can be helpful to us um, in the context of this broader idea about showing concern for practical implications. And so now I want to show how I think that can work by coming back to that example of the sea level rise um, at last. So I hope you've all been thinking about what you might have done if you were one of these scientists faced with this problem of how to communicate a threat that you couldn't fully put numbers on. So the th the, there were two um, strategies that were considered at the time in particular. So one was um, just to refuse to put any numbers on sea level rise at all on the grounds that one couldn't do that responsibly, knowing that there was this significant factor that couldn't yet be measured and predicted. The second one um, was to make a table that gave the numbers for the two sets of factors that could be um, assessed at the time, um, but then had a little note saying, well, there's this third factor, and we can't tell you anything about it, um, but it's there, might be, it's going to be there also. And that's actually what happened. You can see um, table SPM3 from the fourth assessment um, report, working group one, that um, exactly did that. It, it just said, here's the range excluding future rapid dynamical changes in ice flow, which is the factor I was talking about. Now what happened though is that of course when you have numbers, people use them and they don't look at the footnote and so or they look at it but they don't know what to do with it. And so a lot of policymakers started doing work based on the numbers that were there, but those numbers were known to the scientists to be too low because there was this factor that they hadn't been able to include. And so arguably um, many people were um, misled or at least um, given guidance that wasn't helpful and potentially even dangerous for their calculations. So here's the third option that I think Aristotle might help us um, to advise. Um, and this would be um, to exercise subjective expert judgment based on all the available evidence um, to come up with a number um, based on a kind of best guess, if you will, and to set that off saying, you know, this is, doesn't have the same level of confidence as these other numbers, but here's our best guess because we know that in your practical concerns, you're going to have to um, be using numbers. Now, I think in an interesting way, that would have been an approach demonstrating hu humility, a kind of epistemic humility, um, because it would have to deviate from the standard IPCC approach, which was to rest itself wholly on um, published papers and you know, numbers that can be based wholly um, on that evidence. But it would have also been the most oriented towards the practical. It would have recognized that people need numbers that they can use and that the practical concerns of trying to address sea level rise actually may warrant that willingness of scientists to um, be more humble and yet more useful, um, more oriented towards concerns demonstrating their warmth, their concern for the policymakers and the public who were going to read that work. Now actually that is what was done by working group two um, in other situations, um, indeed even thinking about ice sheets at the time, working group one went for the footnote approach, exclusion approach, and working group two took this other approach, um, and arguably it's been more um, useful. So let me um, leave that example with you um, and conclude. So I've argued that um, only by demonstrating how and why they're trustworthy can speakers gain full credibility, and that that's going to be a matter not just of cognitive competence, but also of um, warmth understood in this um, systematic way.
And I've suggested that Aristotle can help us to differentiate the uh, interaction between these cognitive factors and a whole range of non-cognitive ones. And he suggested ways that communicators can earn this trust by demonstrating concern for the interests of their audience, by displaying humility, um, by being willing to engage um, on that level over time. So that's the positive Aristotelian vision that I can offer. But I want to conclude by acknowledging some difficulties, just very briefly, for scientists in taking, and any communicators, actually, in taking this path. Because I think it is a kind of tightrope, and I can see that there are dangers on all sides. So in, in counseling this path, I don't mean to say that it's easy. So for one thing, I think that seeing communication as a relationship between speaker and audience um, actually, I think, does help us to understand the real nature of communication, that it's not going to succeed. There's not going to be uptake, practical success, unless the audience gets it. But of course, today, um, unlike in Aristotle's time, when a speaker would literally get to his feet and address an audience whom he could see before him, of course, today, when you speak to one audience, your words may well be recorded, and they may well be on the internet forever, and they may be, as it were, overheard by many different audiences um, to whom you weren't originally intending to speak. Um, and I think that really poses a challenge to our very models of communication. I've given you what I think is the best model of communication, which gives this very serious attention to the interests, the concerns, the capacities of the audience. And yet, we are in a world where we don't know who our audiences um, are. And I think that is a, a real challenge. Moreover, um, I've stressed the ethics that are incumbent on scientists and other science communicators, like science journalists, for example. Um, but of course, when we talk about the ethics of communicating climate change, there may well be, there are speakers about climate change who may not think themselves to be bound by any ethical standards at all, or not to be particularly concerned with what those ethical standards might be. So I think that's another challenge, is that we may say all we want about the ethics of communicating, but who will see themselves as bound um, by that ethics? And finally, I think there's this tightrope between, on the one hand, um, the need to stress that science is not inimical to the interests and concerns of its audiences, um, and that's what I've spent most of my time addressing. But there is this opposite danger that I also mentioned, which happens if scientists seem to usurp democratic authority and dictate public policy too directly. So that's why I tried to stress that this concern with the practical implications doesn't mean dictating a policy agenda, but it means recognizing and taking responsibility for thinking about the ways that research translates into practical implications, which may be one step short of um, policy prescriptions. So I think there's a fine line between the need to recognize the practical implications of one's research and dictating a particular policy response um, to them. So let me leave you to ponder on those final thoughts. I, I find them disturbing, um, and I think that you may also. I don't think our um, ethics of communication has advanced sufficiently, actually, in addressing all of these problems. But I do hope to have persuaded you that the communication of expertise in a democracy is as important for us to think about as it was for Aristotle. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, so about halfway through the talk, you talked about framing, the psychologist's idea of framing, and we can reframe, um, about which you know, you've obviously had an initial reaction, some sort of manipulative trick. Um, and it seemed to set up, set up a question, or a couple of questions to me. I then wasn't sure how Aristotle answered these questions. I mean, one was trying to figure out when framing or some other way of getting a, a message across counts as manipulative, given that things often have to be framed one way or another. And the other is about when, if it is manipulative, this kind of thing is wrong. 
since. Um, you know, sometimes you might think it's permissible to manipulate people in their own interests, or you might not. Uh, a small amount of manipulation for a huge amount of social good, is that justified? Um, so, and then there was these kind of prudential maxims from, or what, that might be not quite right, from Aristotle, you know, earning trust in this way, that way, and the other way. But I wasn't sure how it answered, whether it's intended to answer those middle questions about manipulation and framing. Yeah, thank you, it's a great question. Um, let me say that my, my concern was not that just the word framing should make us suspicious or something like that, but it was rather that um, as much as I have read in the psychological literature, um, I found very little attention to that question. So in a way, my concern was more that they weren't asking the very questions that you've just asked. Um, that what they were saying is, let's just reframe in these various ways and not say, is there any limit to the reframing that we can do? So for example, I mean, when one thinks about the Cahan example of let's just add nuclear power to the mix, right? Now, you know, it might be that as a substantive matter, one thinks nuclear power should be on a list of policy prescriptions to think about climate change. That's a substantive claim. But my concern was that the thought that it should just be added to the mix um, to reassure people that a mechanism that might be more appealing to some of them was there, that didn't seem to me to take seriously um, the, the, the fact that this kind of framing choice was indeed a kind of substantive um, framing choice. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a thought that framing is always manipulative, but it was rather a thought that surely it sometimes is. And don't we need to think about the ethics of that question? And I've been very struck by um, the absence of thinking about it. And, w and when I've heard psychologists talk about this, the farthest that I've heard them go has been to say, make the point that you then made, which is to say, well, things always have to be framed one way or the other. And of course, that's true, but it doesn't seem to me to actually um, be an answer to that question or to really um, address it. Now, I think you're right that what I developed from Aristotle also may not fully be an answer to the question. So I'm willing to say that that's the case. But what I think Aristotle does do is to put ethics absolutely at the center of his conception of rhetoric. So what I think the psychologists do is say, ethics is somehow kind of out there. It's something we acknowledge in a preface. And then we never bring it actually into our perspective or into our studies. We don't collaborate with ethicists, ethicists. We don't see it as something that we actually need to integrate. And what Aristotle, I think, points us to is this conception in which actually the ethical is the heart of what rhetoric is about because it is a relational um, conception. And so to me, that's the starting point. I don't think he, he's, he doesn't give us a full answer to the questions, but he gives us a better starting point than I think, um, I think we have so far. Say so first, I am a scientist and work in the area of climate change and was one of the faculty okay. 25 that wrote the well um, thing. Um, I, I'm fascinated too by the idea of getting ethos and pathos into our communication, but I'd like your thoughts on how we can do that in a written form, such as a public submission yeah. where we can't really do that. And secondly, in the, in, um, when you are interviewed um, for film or television yeah. and media, they edit out about 90% yeah. of what you say. So you, you, it's hard to get that character and humility across yeah. when they're just looking for their yeah. five second sound bite. Yeah, great, thank you very much. I'd actually love to get a copy of the submission. I spent some time trying to find it on the web and, and couldn't, so I only had the report in the university bulletin um, about it. Um, but um, even in that report, though, I actually was struck by some of the things that you, know, you were reported as doing, which I thought did count in interesting ways as doing the sorts of things I was recommending. Um, so for example, in saying, is um, cost the right frame when we think about the much larger kinds of changes that um, climate change might um, threaten for our society? Can we use the kind of standard framing of cost and benefit to assess it. Um, and that sort, of, um, that sort of thinking, so thinking about, well, we're used to thinking about the, as it were, cost seems like the, the right, seems like the emission, and it, sorry, cost seems like the way of thinking about people's interests. And yet actually what one has to do is say, there might be much larger dimensions 
of loss and concern that that kind of technocratic framing in terms of cost leaves out. And so in a way, it would be a way of getting people to think actually our own conception of what's meaningful to us in terms of thinking about taking our interests seriously can, can be rethought and can be um, understood in different ways. Um, and so that, that seemed to me actually a very good example of the kind of thing I was talking about. Um, in terms of your second concern, I, I want to address it, um, but I also want to say that there's a that I, I don't want to make it sound as if all I'm talking about is the role of individual scientists. I think this is also about the role of the institution of science in a way, and it's about you know the, the scientific bodies and things like that. So I don't see that it's the, the framework of relationship makes one think about individual duties, but it also operates, I think, at these institutional um, levels. Um, but I think that as an individual scientist, now of course you can't control what's going to be edited out, and so that obviously is, is a real problem, and of course the whole role in the media here is a major set of issues that I just haven't um, addressed tonight. Um, but, uh, but, but the, um, the idea of saying climate science is something that I think concerns all of us and that as a scientist I work on because as a citizen I think that it is of grave concern to me, to my family, to people um, you know, who I interact with in society. That kind of framing I think can go some way um, towards uh, establishing the kind of um, presumption of good intent um, that I'm talking about. So not seeing it simply as this is something that I do professionally and therefore I'm seeking research money for it, right, as we saw, which is one of the things that can trigger that distrust. Now again, I think this might be counterintuitive because I think the tendency might well be for all of us in a way as professionals to retreat into our professional identity and say, I'm just doing this as a professional, I'm just speaking as a professional. But actually, the thought that the professions have a kind of, um, what I've thought of as a scientific social contract in a way, that there's a sort of basic social contract between science and society to be um, broadly trying to benefit society is an idea that I think um, can be um, powerfully conveyed. So I'd love to have the chance to talk to you more about, um, about your experiences. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the the complexity of audiences and yeah. interests involved in the yeah. debate over climate change and what Aristotle might have to offer um, yeah. by way of wisdom and dealing with that. Because in many cases when you're thinking of potential audiences, there will be the great mass of people whose lives might be in, in various ways put at peril yeah. by the processes of climate change. But then there are these other audiences who are the people who perhaps have the most power to yeah. affect the outcomes whose interests might diverge from those of the wider, yeah. the wider group. Yeah. So politicians who want to seek re-election and in order to deal with climate change might have, have to make decisions which might prove unpalatable or the heads of corporations who might have to confront shareholders with losses. Um, that complexity um, of different interests and different audiences how do you think the practical wisdom of Aristotle would help us resolve some of those communicative issues? Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's a really important question, and in a way, um, if one can if one can distinguish these audiences, in some sense, I think we could already go farther in trying to address them. That one of the closing remarks that I made was that part of the problem is that it's hard to distinguish audiences um, so cleanly in a way. But it's certainly true that there are very different audiences that have different concerns, different interests, and some of them, you know, kind of short-term um, uh, profits, um, you know, to put it most bluntly, um, to be made from continuing um, business as usual. Um, so. I, to, I think that one of the things that Aristotle would help us to see here is actually to think about sources of um, loss, cost, that might be unfamiliar even to those audiences. To kind of continue in the way that I was thinking um, that, I, that I was um, starting before, um, one can say, look, um, there are 
ways of, um, you know, you may, you may frame your conception of your interest in a certain way, but if you see the longer term potential for very significant social breakdown um, for water shortage, for refugees, um, all of these kinds of practical um, concerns, doesn't that frame, or doesn't, sorry, doesn't that way of thinking that broader set of interests impinge on the, the set of calculations that you're originally coming to with? So I think Aristotle would say, in addressing people's interests, you don't have to take them just as given, that the rhetorician, the speaker, has the capacity to engage people in reflection on what their interests actually are. Um, and that too much of the discussion about climate change, again, is kind of framed within this you know, business as usual being tweaked at the margins kind of way. And if one thinks about the possibility for sort of much more radical um, threats to the basic um, uh, dimensions of sort of human order, um, that can change, I think, people's conception of um, what their interests might be. I think there's also been maybe a more heartening shift, even just in the last 10 or um, 20 years since I kind of became involved with this, which is that 10, so even 10 years ago, I think people thought that to talk about climate change ethically, you mostly had to talk about future generations because that was the only people that it was going to affect. And even in the last 10 years, we've seen this real change where people are being affected now. Um, and th now that the rich and powerful may still be relatively insulated, although even then, if Manhattan is under six inches of water, the subways are going to flood. And so, you know, even the wealth and power isn't going to protect everyone then. But um, it may be easier to, you know, th 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 those sort of changing frames of the, um, of the, the sort of temporal um, and geographical sort of impingement of the problem itself, I think, is making some of that um, communication um, easier. Um, uh, you know, I think the final thing to say is that Aristotle, I think, would recognize that, um, F, that, that rhetoric can also be abused. I mean, he's not naive about that. So, um, it's certainly possible for rhetoric to be misused in this debate, and we've seen um, many cases where it has been. Um, I think the challenges to uh, um, the challenges to find these ways of thinking about where interests really lie and where um, a benevolent concern for one's interests. Uh, would really lead one um, to put one's trust. And, and I think there may be some room um, for negotiation there. I think we must finish it there. Um, and on behalf of you all, I'd like to uh, bring our thanks to the Minister for a really fantastic, uh, really fantastic lecture. And I think a really good, um, a really good um, 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 question and answer session at the end, which has opened up some, some new issues. Um, just to, uh, Melissa will be giving Chapman Lecture, which is uh, Wednesday. on Wednesday, Wednesday um, uh, at um, uh, 6, 6 p.m., the, but the maiden bar will be open from 5.30. There you go. <laughs> so um, that's an invitation. So um, I'm sure that um, um, those of you who, who are available will look forward to joining us on that occasion. So thanks very much indeed, Melissa. Thank you very much.